right. Any questions? Where are we? Oh, we're starting something new. No questions? We're okay? Yeah. All right. Um, we, for those of you that have the physics one, we hit this some. We're going to do it a little bit differently. This time so it works. Hopefully it works better. Um, because we're going to do much more involved problems than we did before. Um, ultimately, we're going to have three ways that we solve kinetics problems. We've done one, and we're ready now for the second. Each of the three, and this is no different than it was in physics one, each of the three are a little bit better at solving certain types of problems than the, than the others are. The first one we have for solving kinetics problems is simply F equals MA, Newton's Law. That works very well for general problems. You have the acceleration, you need to find the forces to ensure that acceleration. You have the forces, you need to figure out what the resultant acceleration is, those type of things, rather general problems. The second one that we're going to get on today is the work energy equation. And we're going to hit this one right from the, the start in its full form and use it right from there. Um, I think that will be a a good way for us to be able to get into some fairly complicated or complicated looking problems um, that uh, if we're uh, 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 controlled and, and uh, disciplined about doing this become very easy problems and we'll, we'll see exactly one of those today. This is very good for position dependent type problems wherein something very much depends upon the position in the problem. This is uh, quite true with uh, things like uh, friction that can very easily change at a certain place in a problem. Also has to do with uh, springs since the forces they exert depend very much on the position of the object in relationship to the spring. Um, and it can it also handle the general problem where forces themselves change with position as, as they often do. And then the third method we'll use is the impulse momentum equation. That works real well for time dependent problems as we'll see when we get there. Same three general solutions for kinetics problems that we looked at in uh, Physics 1. We're going to then revisit these near the end of the term when we redo all of this stuff we've been doing for uh, rigid body motion. And we're going to take that a step farther than we did in Physics 1 as well. So. Uh, let's lay out the work energy equation. It's a little bit different in the notation it used with this book than the book we used in Physics 1 and for you other guys when you saw it. Uh, I'm not sure what it looked like. So uh, we'll stick with the notation that's in this book and uh, just be uh, okay with that. I've got a, a little bit of a change with it uh, in, in, in the way I do it. Um, just to I think makes it a little bit more rigorous. But the work energy equation itself looks like this. That first term is the work. When we do work on something, we can change its potential energy. We'll come back to each of these pieces one by one. Change its potential energy. We can change its... No, our book uses a V here. Sorry. We can change its height, or we can stretch or squish a spring. We'll call that E for elastic media. For our purposes, those are the only things we're going to look at. These are, these are all mechanical energy terms of some kind. 
And uh, there are certainly other types of changes that can happen, but we're going to stick with these. So the first one we'll look at is uh, the, the term. This is this is sort of the input to the problem. This is, these are things that can come from the outside. These are this is work done by applied forces. Uh, the best term for this is what we call non-conservative forces. We use a U here because it, if we used a W for work, then it would look like the W for weight, and it would be confusing. Um, defined as, uh, not every book uses this subscript 1, 2. This implies to us it, uh, it, ha it only occurs when there's movement between two points. They could be the same point. It could be that we come back to where we started. But there's got to be some kind of change in position. There's no such thing as a definition of work at a single point. It's only moving from one point to another. So that's why I like to use this subscript there that it, uh, that it reminds us that we've got to be actually doing something, going somewhere with this. There's no such thing as work at a single point. <coughs> So the definition, if you remember, in its full and general form, is something like this. As we go from one place to another, so I'll use S for a general position, um, and this can be 1D or 2D, it doesn't matter. The net force being applied to the object as a vector dotted with our position vector. In this, this case, uh, we'll use the, the differential elemental form because uh, that allows us the possibility that as position changes, the force changes as well. And that can be a change in the direction or the magnitude or both as we do that. So that's the full and general form of our de definition of work. For a special case, just to see what it looks like, for uh, constant force, then that comes out of the integral And we're just integrating ds, uh, would still be a, a dot in there. That's just simply an operator, remember. And the integral of ds becomes delta s. So if the force is constant, it uh, turns out to be simply the force being applied over a certain distance. This kind of makes sense, has good common everyday sense. You apply a little force for a very long way, you could be doing as much work as a big force for a very short distance. So those make some pretty good sense. It is very important to us that we re recognize the utility of this dot product in the, uh, in the setup of the problem, in the, in the definition of the work. Easiest way to, to show that is uh, imagine pushing some object across the floor some certain distance. And doing so with a force like that, the dot product gives us the fact that it's only the 
component of the force in the direction of the motion that's doing any work. The dot product will do that for us automatically. The component of the force perpendicular to the work does no work because there's no motion in that direction. Delta Y in the direction of the Y force does no work. It does not mean that this has nothing to do with the problem. If you remember the uh, an applied downward force can increase the normal force on an object. You increase the normal force on an object, you increase the friction on an object and friction is most definitely one of these non-conservative applied forces. So don't think that Fy doesn't have any, any play in it. It does. Uh, it just doesn't have any direct contribution to the work. Sound sort of familiar so far? A little bit? Frank, did you, have you seen this before? Maybe not in this precise form, but yeah. something like it. Pat, you too? Yeah. Okay. Um, this term, non-conservative work, this tells us what forces we can actually put in here. There are other forces in the problem, but they don't all go into this part of the calculation. Non-conservative forces are those forces that if we turn the problem around, we don't get back what we've lost to those forces. Or, um, well, we, we can't recover the work done by those forces if we turn the problem around. The easiest example is friction. You push something across the floor, you work against friction the entire way. You turn around and push it back, you, work, you double the amount of work you had to do against friction. You don't get that back and return to a zero point. There's still all the all the abrasion that went on, all the heat that was generated, and you don't get any of that back. You cannot return to your original situation with non-conservative forces. So we'll do some, some problems uh, applying this work as we go, but let's uh, remind ourselves what each of the four ter terms are and uh, how to deal with them. Uh, of course, the units on this, let's see, force times distance, so the units are Newton meters. When talking about work and energy type problems, we define one Newton meter of work or energy as a joule. Um, I don't find any great utility in finishing a problem like this. If you finish it with Newton meters, just leave it there. But um, it, is, it is certainly a viable and well-used unit for these type of problems. So that's the work term. Uh, it works very nicely if uh, there's a position dependence upon force, as, uh, as we'll see in some of the problems. The second uh, term is the kinetic energy term. Which simply means if we do work on an object, we could change its speed. If we do positive work, we can increase its speed. If we do negative work, which is what friction did, does, because friction is always against the direction of motion, if we do negative work, we can slow something down. Uh, we can't have both going on at once, so we'll see this term um, in, in all kinds of different ways. The units. Let's 
let's see, mass is kilograms, velocity squared, there's velocity, there's velocity squared. What are those units in uh, more, perhaps more familiar terms? If we take kilogram, meters, just one of the meters, but both seconds, and rearrange them to look like that. Same units, just rearranged. That first term is a newton. And we have exactly the same units as we had for the work term, which we must, or they wouldn't be equal. So we're going to find that all four of these have exactly the same units. Uh, if we're in English units, we have pound-foots, more commonly said foot-pounds, but we have those very same units. Now every year I go over this. I find it necessary to do this, even though I will have a few of you who will, will uh, neglect to pay attention to this fact. So, I'll put it down here. V2 squared minus V1 squared, which we need for the kinetic energy term, is not equal to V2 minus V1 quantity squared. Yeah, you're shaking your head, Jake. Somebody in here, you might as well volunteer now, is going to try to do this. Nobody's volunteering? Frank, you're volunteering? No? no? Pay attention to that. That, that. that isn't even a legitimate physics one mistake, much less a, a second year dynamics mistake. Alright, so so far We've got the possibility if we do some work on something, we can change its speed. All these pieces are developed in the book, and I don't see any great need to, uh, to repeat that. So um, I think it's a lot more instructive if we get to some problems we wouldn't get to otherwise if we deal through all the development of each of these pieces. So the next piece is the delta VG, the gravitational, that's the G, potential energy. Our book uses a V. I'm not real sure why, but it does. It's easy enough. This is a term, perhaps you're more familiar with this than even the kinetic energy term. This just relates to us the possibility that we might have a change in elevation in the presence of a gravitational field. If there's no gravitational field, then delta H is meaningless. If there is, then it applies as written. Remember here that this is not uh, a distance traveled by the object. It's simply a change in elevation in the direction of the gravitational field. So if we have some mass, we raise up to some height delta H, that has the same change in gravitational potential energy as an object that goes a greater distance but still only goes up the same height in the, in the direction of the gravitational field. And this all depends upon the implication, the, the uh, 
yeah, the implication that uh, gravity is straight down. So we don't have to worry about our, any, any of the distance it travels, just simply its increase in height. If we have a decrease in height, then that, uh, of course, that delta Vg would be negative. And once again, the units, see, kilograms times meters per second squared times meters for the height. Well, this first piece here is simply Newton. So once again, we get Newton meters or joules for the units as they should be. We can't add one thing with one unit to something with different units. All of these must have the same units. So those usually look pretty familiar to most students. Um, the, the other one, um, I've always had trouble with the way the books do it because I think they set it up for uh, uh, more errors than need be. So we'll revisit it in a much better way, which of course is my problem. And this is the elastic potential energy term. The fact that we may have in the problem a spring. Springs can store energy, they can accumulate it, they can uh, disperse it, and uh, we have to take into account that fact. The, the, the uh, slight bit of complication is the fact that strings, uh, springs can be stretched and store energy, or they can be compressed and store energy. It's not a a uh, one-way thing like it is with the gravitational potential energy. Sorry. It's a two-way thing. Sorry? Uh, that's why it's a conservative force. If you, re if you pull a spring out, then let it return back to where it was before you're, in, at least in terms of the spring, in exactly the same place you were. Other terms, the fact that you had to reach in there and do that, or there might be friction, those kind of terms are always over here. It depends upon the strength of the spring. So this term is known as the spring spring strength or spring modulus or spring constant. Any of those terms are all fine. Remember that tells you how much strength this, how much force the spring can exert once it's been either stretched or squished. Which we take into account with that second term there. The trouble I find with most of the other books, um, and I believe ours is one that does it, they very often put an X in here, which I think is confusing because there could be an X in the problem, a position in the problem you label X, that is different than the X that goes here on the spring, uh, the spring equation. That uh, term del, is the difference in the spring from its rest length. So at any time in the problem it could have length L, which is greater than, say, its rest length, so del would be positive. The rest, the, the length of the problem could be the Spring could be also squished some, so L is less than its rest length. But once we square that, it doesn't matter whether it's positive or negative. Uh, 
which just shows us that a spring can store energy whether stretched or compressed. This rest length, that's the length of the spring as it comes out of the box after you went to Ace Hardware and got it from Earl. It'll be right there sitting there right in the box. And the K is also something determined by the manufacturer of the spring. It has to do with how tightly wound it is, how thick the wire is, uh, and what material it's made of. Units. Remember what the units on K are? No units on one half. It's what? Newtons per meter. It tells us to stretch a spring one meter, how many newtons must we exert on it to do that? If we need to squish the spring one meter, how many newtons must we push to do that? And then del squared, of course, is a length term. So this has units of, that has units of meter squared. So again, we have units of newton meters. <coughs> That's it. That's the work energy equation. Uh, I think all the other stuff that goes into it is interesting, more so to physics students generally than engineering students. Engineering students usually like to get to work on things rather than look at all the background theory and development to get to some place. That's why we're engineers. We have work to do. So let's do, uh, let's set up a problem and use it. Might be the type of thing you'd have to do if you're designing warehouses for UPS. Imagine a crate of somebody's shipment being delivered from uh, the back of a truck into the warehouse or something. It needs to slide down a ramp. You don't want it to damage itself when it gets there. So you develop some kind of bumper system to cushion the uh, impact of the box when it gets to the bottom. So, put some numbers on this. Let's say that's 23 degrees. 8 kilograms. <gasps> Bless you. Thank you. Uh, coefficient of friction. of 0.24 spring constant of 121 newton meter per meter And you want to determine by how much the spring will squish. If it's too much, then the box might go ahead and hit the wall anyway. If it's too little, then maybe the spring's not really doing as much cushioning as it should. How long is the ramp? Uh, oh yeah, that's in there too. 3.2 meters to the initial contact point with the spring. Alright, fairly simple set, fairly simple problem, but if you just start throwing everything into the work energy equation, it's going to be 
prohibitively difficult to solve. So if you want to do that, just start throwing the things in and ignore me. Go ahead. If you'd rather follow along, I'll show you just how easy it can be to use this equation, especially on a problem like this. I've seen this type of problem. I remember trying to do it and uh, just you get lost in the units, the mathematics, and the minus signs. So, here's our first step. Go through any of the four terms and determine if any of them are zero. If so, we're already at a smaller problem and things are getting easier. Is there any work being done by non-conservative forces? Is anybody reaching in and pushing or pulling or shoving in any way? We have friction in this problem. That's, that's the classic non-conservative force. There's no way we can let this slide down the hill, push it back up the hill, and get back what we lost to friction. So there's definitely some work being done that we have to keep in there. Is there any change in speed? Well, of course there is. It's just sitting here at a rest, and then it slides down the ramp, and then it comes into the bumper and is brought to a stop. That's not the concern here, though. The concern is, and is there any change in speed from the initial point compared to the last point? We don't care what happened in between. So this is our first point. And this down here is our second point. Is there any difference in the speed between those two points? If there's not, that's all we care about. We don't care about anything else. So in this case, we can already make the problem 25% smaller by getting rid of that term. since V1 equals V2. It started from rest, it finishes at rest. It doesn't matter what else it did in between. We term something like that a point function. Anything that only depends upon the endpoints, we call a point function. The work term is a path function because it depends on where we go. The farther we go, the, the different surfaces we go over, all of those uh, increase the work being done. The third term, very simply, is there any change in altitude? Yes. Of course there is. Started up the ramp, finished the bottom ramp. Is there any change in the length of a spring in the problem? Of course there is. It was at rest to start with, compressed at the finish. We want to find what happens when the spring, uh, the, the box brings that spring all the way to its point of compression. All right. Now that we've made the problem 25% smaller, go back and do each one of these one at a time, paying attention to the units and the minus signs at this time. Because now it's a very easy thing to do. The problem is really small. It's not too big a deal. Alright, any work being done by non-conservative forces? Yeah, we have the friction. That's doing non-conservative work. There's no work being done by the normal force. Why not? It's not the direction of movement. There's no movement in the direction of the normal force. Is there any work being done by the weight? Yes. 
Yes, there's most definitely movement in the direction of weight. However, what, Jake? Recover that in the potential energy. Program. That term is taken care of over here. That's conservative work. If we let it fall down and then we bring it back up to where it was, the weight is still the same, gravity is still the same, there's been no change in the problem in that way. We have to do work to do that. So the only friction force we have is friction. It's in the opposite direction of the motion. That's why we have a minus sign. If we did the dot product on the vectors of this, it would give us just exactly that. If you remember, friction is the coefficient times the normal force. And the normal force is equal to that component of the weight, that component of the weight in the y direction. So, is that sine or cosine of 23? That angle between the normal and the weight is always the same as the incline, so this is cosine 23. Do we have all of those values? Now hang on, there are a lot of people working real hard here and I don't think you've got the whole thing in mind here. What is delta x? We've got all these other pieces. Coefficient of friction is 0.24. The weight is 8 kilograms times 9.81 meters per second squared. Cosine 23, you're going to have to look up yourself. What is delta x? Three point two meters? Three point two? Not quite. Plus x. What? Plus x. No. Three point two plus x. No. Plus del. The amount the spring squishes. That's why I don't like using uh, that for squishing. That's in meters. So if we carry this calculation all the way through, which we will, we've already ascertained that the delta we're looking for will be in meters. We've got to watch this as we go along. So what's that, uh, what's that equal to? That's just a, a quick calculator business for us. Reduce it down to its farthest point. We've got kilogram meters that we've got. We've got units of newton meters as we should. We're in the SI system, so let's make all of these terms in newton meters. Get the units right when we got just a small problem. This is very easy to do so far. One straight term plus one something times del. We got it, Jake. 
got it? Uh, equals negative fifty five point four eight plus negative, negative fifty five point five plus a negative um, or minus. Yeah. Yep. I, I already did that seventeen point three four yep. del minus seventeen point three del and we know that's all of them that have units of newton meters if del is in meters. Everybody not get that? Can we get anything different? All right, we'll do the second term. Delta V G M G Delta H. What's this term? Let's see, M we've got, that's eight kilograms. G is nine point eight one meters per second squared. And Delta H is getting a little tight here. I'll just put the delta H in there and then we'll write the delta H here. What's delta H? It's what'd you say? 3.2 plus del times 3.2 plus del meters times the sine of 23. Is that all? Nope. It's minus. It's going down. We need to take care of all the units and the minus signs at one time. So this term also has a delta H in it. When we put all those pieces together, you should get Del. Oh, it's all the same stuff we had here. Sine 23. Anybody got it? Alex, you have those numbers yet? Please. The, the rest of this worked out. It would be just that times that and then times sine 23. What do you have? I don't know. I don't know. It's not. I have negative 98.1 okay. minus 30.7 down millimeters. Negative 9.81. Minus what? 30.7. Yep. And we know that's in Newton meters, and again, we determine the del itself must be in meters. All right, so keep track of each of these pieces. We're just doing a little little problems one at a time. Let's see. Uh, U12 was what? 50. <coughs> Plus 17.3 del. Is that right? Delta 
BG Alex just gave us. Oops, that's a minus. Remember, we're just going to take care of all these things as we go. So the last part then is delta VE, which is 1 half K del 2 squared minus del 1 squared. And we've got all those pieces. What was the spring strength? 121. Del 2, well that's the one we're looking for. And del 1 is 0. The spring was at rest uh, while the box was at the top of the slope. That will have units of meters. That will give us newton meters. And so what's that last term? Whatever one half of 21 is, 60.5. Del square, Newton meters. Something wrong? I thought we had negatives on the first term before. We might have. Yeah, we along. Yep, we did. Oh, yeah. Yeah, as it should have been, the negative work by the friction. That's the only uh, non-conservative force doing any friction. All right. So those two are on the same side. So we can add those directly together. And we can bring this over. And we get a simple quadratic in del. Should look something I don't know if those are the right numbers. So let's see, help me with the calculator. Let's see, we'll have a 60.5 del squared. That's the only term we had. The only term we had with the del squared in it. Then remember this is negative, but it's on the other side. So it's 98.1 minus 98.1 plus 55.5, which is what, 42.6? But it'll be minus? And then we'll have a minus 30.7 del. Minus 30.7 del plus, because we'll bring it over 17.3, 13.4. That's a pretty easy problem to solve. If you put everything into here, you wouldn't have an easy problem to solve. This is a very easy problem to solve. Some of you even have a quadratic equation solver on your calculator to make it really easy. Uh oh, I didn't check these numbers. It'll be interesting to see if this quadratic actually works out. Does it? I don't know. I'm not going to get that program. Does it you got to download it? 
Yeah, um, if you look around for it online and then have the connector that allows you to download stuff to your calculator online, which they have in the math lab, I think, if we don't have them here. I think we have a couple of the plugs here. If not, you can use the quadratic equation solver minus b plus or minus b squared minus 4ac over 2a, right? Or graph it. Find out where it, where it equals zero. Same thing. What do you get? Huh? So del equals point nine six meters. Anybody else get that? I, uh, I don't have the, my answer there. If it turned out that there were no real roots, if this under the square root was negative, what would that mean? If there were no real roots to this equation? So stretch, stretch. No? Stretch. Yeah. It would mean with this friction, the box never actually gets to the spring and there's no real solution to it which is certainly a possibility. But that would have showed itself as non-real roots. Uh, were there two roots? I would assume so. Uh, actually, it's the negative root I guess we want because we're talking about spring squish. Where they, they probably weren't the same. positive root I think would be if we squished the spring this much and then let it go, the spring would extend to that much as the, the problem was trying to reverse itself. I, I, I think, I'm not positive that that's what that would represent. But the point being, if you watch, if you do each of the sections one at a time, watch your units, watch your minus signs, you end up with a very, very easy problem to solve. If you put everything into there, all of this stuff into there, first thing you're going to stop worrying about is your units. You're not going to put those up there anymore. So you could screw those up. You're also going to lose minus signs. Uh, we didn't have to worry about this minus sign, but if it was the other way around, if this was zero and this wasn't, it's very easy to lose that minus sign. So I very highly recommend you do this problem each little piece at a time as you go through it. it. Makes it an awful lot simpler. That's extremely easy to solve for you guys. Now if you want to, uh, as an exercise, put all of them in there and just make sure you can do it, go ahead. That's just an accident waiting to happen, I think. It sure wouldn't be for me if I was doing it. All right, ready for one of your own? All right, same thing, work energy equation. So when you start to solve these, that's the first thing you should write down, is the work energy equation, see if any of the parts disappear and we have an easier problem. Here's a, uh, a smooth shaft with a spring there at the top. Down here at the bottom is a smooth collar that can slide on that shaft. A 
attached to the middle of that collar and it's height is 150 millimeters attached to that is a cable that runs up to a pulley that's right level with the spring and somebody's pulling on that cable let's see this distance here is 225 millimeters this distance here is 450 and this angle over here is 36 degrees What else? Let's see. All right, this force is 200 newtons. Okay. Find K, the spring stiffness. How big a spring do you need to go down to Earl and buy? So that the amount the spring is squished, as you pull on this force, it's going to pull the cable, the, the collar up. It's going to hit the spring. We need to limit Dell to 75 millimeters. I would suspect this sounds like a nasty and complicated problem. So break it into smaller pieces that aren't so nasty and complicated. Checking your units, checking your minus signs as you go. Label at least parts if we need them. That's part A, point A. Call that point B if you need it. We've got that little pulley up there. Call that up there, C if you want. And Maybe when it gets squished. <coughs> and call that point B, I guess. Whatever you want. Huh? Looks like a big problem, huh? Did it be nasty? Is it intimidating? No? Break it into four pieces. Remember, the first thing you do is go over that and see if any of those parts disappear. If they do, the problem's already smaller. Every time you make the, small, the problem smaller, all the better. How many that be? Arm band, whatever that color. Okay, I'll, did that start from last? Yes. If 
any of the pieces are giving you a little bit of trouble, then go on to one of the other ones for a bit. So if you break it into four small pieces, no, Frank's not going to do it that way. That's totally the idea. It's neither. Because as it comes up, those angles change, but that never changes. get in there. Got the force is 200. Starts from rest at the bottom. Okay. Delta T. Change in kinetic energy. Zero. The, certainly it picks up speed, but then it loses it again once it hits the spring. All we care about is the start compared to the finish. Between point A and point D is all we care about. Any other parts that are zero? The what? The work? Are there any outside forces being applied? Yeah, but the collar itself doesn't move in the X direction. The collar doesn't move in the X direction. Uh, if I, by X direction, I assume you mean the direction of the force. Right. I mean, the collar's not moving sideways, no. Figure out what work is being done by that force. Look at that force. change in height and we have a force doing some work to figure out how much force that work is doing. I mean how much work that force is doing. That's what I meant. that we realize is the change in those energy terms that we're interested in. Change in height, change in spring potential energy.
let's see, uh, delta V G is M G delta H. We've got M, we've got G, what's delta H? The change in height of the collar. That's the only thing changing height. Uh, technically, the spring, the center of mass goes up a little bit as the spring compresses, but we're not going to mess with that. We're not going to worry about that. So this collar will go up a certain height. Just how far? How much? Well, the, the center of it will go up the 450. So it's going to finish with the center right, uh, right level with B. Won't it? Because 75 millimeters of the collar is above that center point, and that's how much spring squish we're going to allow. So the collar is going to finish with its center right level. So how much height did it actually gain? The 450 plus 75, which is how much? Not 87 kilograms. Do you have something to say? Speak up. It's All I can hear is these little mumbles, and then I have to keep asking for you to repeat. How much? 545 Thank kilometers. You. Thank you. But, <laughs> huh? See, now you're mumbling again. Well, boy, isn't that big news. Hairline's going back, hair's turning white. I heard it all the time, and i got to hear from you I'm getting old. <laughs> Do the units work out? Is there a minus sign? And so what's that come to be? 36,000. 30, 36,000? 36.1 Newton meters. 36.1 Newton meters. Ah, that's right. Okay, a little bit of geometry work on that one, but basically we have that. Kinetic energy term. The K we don't know. But that's where that unknown is going to come into the equation for us to find it. Let's see. Del 1 is 0 and del 2 is the limit of 75 millimeters. So if K is in newtons per meter, this will have units of newton meters. So what's 0.057 squared? 00281. Oh, and that half is in there as well. What was it? 2281. No, not that. <coughs> and that's Newton meters. If K is in Newtons per meter itself. 
So we already worked out the units on K. Remember, we're reducing this down to a very simple equation with a single unknown. So that's the right-hand side, all set. Thirty-six point one plus oh oh two eight one K. How much work was done? We have a constant force, so that integral will work out that way. Then all it depends upon is what's that delta S? Is it this distance that the collar moves? Trouble with that is, if we do it by that, the force on the collar changes. It's first here, then it's there, then it's there. Its angle is changing all the time. The dot product is going to change all the time. The integral of that, I think, would be kind of nasty to do. Is there an easy way to figure out what work was done by the force? The easier way to do it is to figure out how far that force actually moved itself in its own direction. It's a force being applied in that direction. If it moves in that direction, that's got to be how much work it does. Can you figure that out? Isn't that this distance minus that distance? Is how much of the cable is actually pulled over the force would move that far in that direction. So the force is 200 newtons. What is this distance? 225 squared, 450 squared. Actually 450 plus the, the little bit extra. What is this distance? Uh, 503. 583. 503. 503. So it's... 503 actually in meters. I want to take care of the unit side. Huh? Do you use the, when you're doing that, do you use the 525 or the 450? Well, it depends on your your right triangle is right there. So you do Pythagorean theorem on whatever the right triangle is. It's 225 across the top, across the bottom it's 450 plus the 75. 572? Yeah, 572? Yeah. That's millimeters, so we'll turn it to meters. Remember, we want the units to work out here. But it ends up with still the 225 over there. That will give us units of newton meters. What's that come out to be then? I heard different things. We agree, we're just off by dust. Oh, how much path? 69.3. 69.3 newton meters. Close enough. So we have 
point three, the whole equation, all the units checked, all the um, minus signs checked. Now you've got a really simple little equation to solve for one a single unknown. And you already know the units are going to work out because they had to back here to give you newton meters in this. goes very easily under pressure. Okay, so I think uh, I think Wednesday will be ready for even harder problems. Wednesday, I'll right. come. Yeah, I can do it. I'll see you Thursday, maybe. I'm not coming Thursday. 